Hi, I'm Ben Hobson, and I'm going to start a new YouTube series on having a look at some of my favorite authors and deconstructing what they've done well. Taking a look at the behind the scenes, sort of look at how they've actually done something via their text, and then showing you guys how have they done what they've done, and maybe you can apply some of these own principles to your own writing practice. Trent Dalton, hugely successful debut novelist, he's also a journalist. He's also a really nice guy. Um, if you ever want to follow him on any of his social media, um, you'll just see how his posts are littered with his kindness and his generosity. I was blown away by this book um, and just how clever it is and how well written it is. But the thing I want to talk about today is one particular thing that I found he did well and something that really delighted me when I was reading his novel, and that is the sneaky setup. What is it? Let me explain. The sneaky setup is... All writing and all good storytelling really hinges on this idea of setup and payoff. So you set something up and then you pay it off later. In the first act, the robber has a gun. In the last act, the robber shoots the gun. It's just as simple as that. Now, setup and payoff can be done really poorly. And I think you'll, if you, if you scan your brains, you'll find a few instances of it. I was just watching Justified, which is a show I love, don't get me wrong. But there was just this little instance of where uh, a criminal tucked a gun into his the back of his pants and the camera went right on to that exact instance of when that's happening and you go, ah, oh, okay, well that gun's going to come back out later. And sure enough, in the end, Raylan grabs a gun, shoots someone else with the gun. Simple as that. But what Trent does well and what really good writing is, is about setting up something in a way that the audience member the reader doesn't even understand that they're being set up. This is the sneaky setup. And the reason it's so effective is because it's surprising. The audience doesn't actually know that they're being fed something, so it can come back later and surprise you. And I've heard, I can't remember where, and I did actually try to find it, that a lot of good emotion in storytelling actually comes through surprise. And we all think of that shock scare in a horror film or something like that where the audience is actually scared out of their seats and it's a shocking moment. That is an emotion, fear, but all the other emotions come from surprise as well. Comedy hinges on surprise, where it's that clever twist on something you didn't quite see coming. Or drama, those really heartfelt moments where you, you tear up and you, you feel moved. Those are those moments that really just surprise you in some way, where something unexpected happens. Emotion comes from surprise, and so the sneaky setup is a great form of storytelling because it actually sets up something in a way where you can never know that it's going to come back. It's a sneaky setup. One of the first times I actually noticed this and I was aware of this in storytelling was actually through The Simpsons. Uh, there's this great episode of The Simpsons called Boy Scouts in the Hood where Homer and Bart and Ned and Rod, Todd, I forget what, one of the kids... They get washed out to sea on a raft, and it's a Boy Scout adventure. Anyway, the setup is, and I'll show a clip of it, the setup is that Homer is an idiot. And so Ned is looking around for a map that he brought to navigate, and Homer's wearing it as a pirate hat. It gets swept away, and then Homer brings out his map. Take a look. Well, what happened to that gosh darn map I brought? Hmm? Um, I don't know. But lucky for you, somebody here is responsible. Hey, there's a new Mexico. And now, that is self-contained. That is a joke unto itself. That's funny. You laugh, you go, ha ha. And it's so quick, and so they just brush it off. You don't even notice that it's there. You don't know, though, that later on, when they're swept out to sea, Homer suddenly smells burgers in the midst of this mist and this fog. Watch this next clip. The full stench of death is upon us. Mmm, hamburger. Hey, wait! I smell hamburgers, too! According to this map, there's a crusty burger on an offshore oil rig! That's what you're smelling, Homer! Oh, if it weren't for this blasted fog, we'd be saved! Never mind the fog! That way! Steer! There isn't much time! So, see how it came back? And it's this little surprise thing. Oh, that's... That's the sneaky setup. And this is something that this bloke, Trent, does incredibly well. I would say an estimate at least 10 times significant 
setups happen without me even being aware that they're setups. I'm just flowing along with the story. I don't even know that it's happening. And so when that payoff happens, that emotion happens as well. I'm going to show you an instance of where Trent has done this. And again, it's littered throughout the novel. But if you turn to page, let's open our hymnals. Uh, so this page, page 66. Oh, by the way, spoiler alert, please don't watch this before you read this. This is brilliant. Do not spoil yourself. I'm not giving away big major things, but I'm giving away some stuff that's towards the end. So please make sure that you do read this before you watch this. Read this before you watch this. Yeah. So on page 66, there's actually a chapter and that chapter is called Boy Receives Letter. And so Eli Bell is this little kid and he is 12 years old. He grows up in a fairly difficult environment, but he is a kid that is full of hope and he never judges someone on the basis of their um, tattoos or who they are. He always approaches everybody with the same amount of kindness. He's a really, and that's why he's such a good character to root for, because you love that about him, that he has hope. So in this page, and as you can see, there's a chapter devoted to it. And then whenever it's italicized, that's actually Eli writing a letter to a person in prison. And it's this little joke about that the people in prison want to know what's happening on the Days of Our Lives episodes. But you get a sense of Eli through these letters. You get to actually see him um, just talk and treat people with their humanity. And so that's all I thought it was. I thought that this was just um, Trent's way of sort of showing us Eli's character, who he is as a person, and what makes him tick, what makes him a special character. And I left it at that. I just thought they were little interesting things. And they're sort of spread out, but maybe every hundred pages or so, you might have a little letter or something that he's writing to this guy named Alex. All right, so page 395. So that much book. And Eli's older now. I think at this stage he's about 17 or 18 years old. But you can see how much of this actually happens in book time before the, the, the payoff. Um, before I read this next thing to you, so I'm actually going to read this bit out so we can all see how Trent's done this. Um, I'm going to play a little clip of Trent speaking to um, Danny V on the Words and Nerds podcast, which is a really great podcast that I suggest you all listen to if you're interested in insights into the writing process, because um, Danny's a really great interviewer. Um, the interview with Trent, he actually talks about this very specific thing about the setup and the payoff, so have a listen. And I wanted to write something that had that really long time arc where you're sort of almost in that Dickensian way, you know, that you can do something young and then the payoffs will come, you know, when you're older. And I love that in storytelling. I love that in, you know, the great thick books of the world where you've got the time to really have your payoffs happen, you know, on the last page of the book, something that happens in the first 15. And I think that's really special. And all right, so I'm going to read this to you, and this is a bit, but I, I just, I want to actually show this because I like to show the text. How does he do this in text? So we're going to have a look. I'm going to put it up, and sorry for the bad iPhone photos of the book. I figure it will suffice and you'll get by. Oh, so a little bit of the setup. So um, Eli and August's mum is in a really t difficult relationship with this guy named Teddy. She's trying to escape from it. Eli and August and their dad are trying to shield her from this guy named Teddy. Um, so she's in their house. Teddy rocks up with baseball bats and two guys who are there to drag her out by her hair. And he's a horrible guy. Eli wants to stand up to her, but doesn't know how. And while this has been happening, this guy, this guy in a gray coat, gray um, suit, has just started driving around. We don't know who he is. And at the same moment that Teddy rocks up with these guys with the baseball bats, um, this guy in the gray suit goes and stands at the front of their house with a present. So after a bit of an exchange where this gray suited guy says to back off the lady, said to leave her alone. And he's very quiet, but he's stern. This is what happens. Go home, mate, the man in the gray coat reasons. Lady said you're done. Teddy shakes his head, laughing, turns back to his two goons who are gripping their baseball bats, spoiling for action, speed thirsting for water and blood. As Teddy turns back, he sucker swings his aluminium baseball bat hard and fast at the head of the stranger on our porch steps, and the stranger ducks like a boxer, not taking his eyes off the threat, and he drives his clenched left fist hard into Teddy's fatty right ribcage, and he pushes up from his feet beneath Teddy, transferring the power in his calves and his thighs and his pelvis into the fury of his right fist that uppercuts the bottom of Teddy's chin. 
Teddy wobbles on his feet in a bash haze, and he finds his focus just in time to see the stranger's forehead butting into the tip of his nose, making his nose bones snap, crackle, and pop in an abstract splatter painting of human blood. I know this man now for what he is, a prison animal, a freed prison animal, the panther, the lion. I cry tears of madman happiness when I see Teddy's mangled face lying unconscious on the ground, and a name reaches my dry lips. Alex. I whisper. So when that happened in the novel, when I figured out that that was Alex, like that, that feeling of just like, yes, yes, Alex. Um, and that, that I just, I felt, I felt clever. I felt like I'd figured something out and I felt like Eli's hope and his, his kindness had been rewarded. And in that there was so much. Now, if, if Trent hadn't have done that, if he hadn't have set that up as well as he did, if that sneaky setup wasn't as sneaky, I guess you could say, you would sense the strings. That's called a deus ex machina, where I actually probably am really mispronouncing it. Deux ex machina? Machina? Whatever. That's where something comes in and just sort of saves the day at the end. And when that happens, the reader or the, the viewer or the, the listener feels cheated. And of course they do, because it's just come out of nowhere. But if you can set up things in a way like Trent does, where the audience member doesn't even notice it happening, all those payoffs are even sweeter. And that is good, subtle storytelling. That's what Trent Dalton does well. All right, thank you very much for listening to me today. I hope you got something out of this video. Um, please, I'd actually really love, what I'd love is some comments down below on what sort of authors you'd like to see me do next. Give me some suggestions about what authors you'd like me to take a look at next because I'm always hungry for um, new books and new authors especially. Thanks very much, see you next time.